Pues ya se está. Fue. Leo. developed as, a, as the, uh, the Treaty of the Meter hundreds of years ago. Um, I'm very glad to be here and I want to thank my hosts and start my timer so I don't take too long. A um, few things that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start uh, by giving some motivation for why we want to measure small mass and forces. Uh, and then I will describe how we uh, link small mass measurements to Planck's constant with this electrostatic force balance and how that, uh, how that interfaces with the recent redefinition of the international system of units. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we optimize these measurements to get as small a force as we can. And then, uh, and then once we have that knowledge, how we can use this to go on to do some new kinds of interesting measurements. So instead of using electrostatic force or gravitational force, uh, we can start looking at uh, photon momentum forces, so photon pressure forces, light reflects from the surface. Okay, uh, some of our motivations. Uh, this is mainly uh, industrial in the United States, where uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST is the part of the U.S. Department of Commerce which is mainly concerned with business in the United States. Um, so uh, a, couple of the, a couple of the things that are of interest in the United States are automotive or environmental particulate modification. So if you have a diesel engine, you emit small particles from the exhaust. Um, the, the National uh, Institute of, of Health Metrics and Evaluation estimate that this contributes up to 5 million deaths a year. So this is an important thing to be able to study and to be able to minimize those. And you need to be able to measure quantities accurately uh, to 50 micrograms of material, which is about you know, the weight of an eyelash. So uh, there's also, in the semiconductor industry in the United States is very large. Um, thin film deposition techniques often deposit nanograms of material. 
So very, very small amounts of material. Often a layer of it is only several atoms thick. Um, cool. uh, atomic force microscopy. This is a technique that some of you specialists may know. It's a technique for imaging surfaces, but you can also use it to measure the mechanical properties of surfaces at a very small scale. The pharmaceutical industry. If you ever uh, been with someone who's taking medication and looked at the dosage, you're looking at milligrams, you're looking at micrograms. These are definitely what I consider to be a small mass regime. And so being able to accurately quantify this for health and pharmaceuticals is important. Uh, radio nuclide metrology, some of my friends came to me. They're interested in doing uh, in doing the quantified radio nuclides for cancer therapy treatments. And uh, small mass measurements are required for that. Um, and then something I'll talk about laser, or rather later, is laser power measurement. Um, so I want to start by defining what I'm talking about when I, when I say small, and what the, the previous system looked like, and where, why this, we decided to be a new project to measure small mass and small force. Historically, all mass and force in the inter international system of units has come from one thing. It is, it is the, uh, a kilogram, the kilogram. It is in a uh, vault outside of Paris. <coughs> it is a cylinder of platinum iridium, about this big. And it weighs, by definition from the Treaty of the Peter, exactly one kilogram. And this has been the standard for hundreds of years. Um, now, uh, in just a moment, I'll get to why this is changing. But under this system, there is a difficulty with getting to small masses and small forces. If we start at a kilogram, to get to a milligram, we have to have something that is a million times smaller. Right. And so how do we do that? Well, there's a process called subdivision that we use. And I'll give you a simple example. If I have a balance measures two masses, if they're the same, it balances, right? If I have two half kilogram masses on one side, kilogram mass on the other, and they balance, then I, and then, so I know I have kilogram on both sides, then I take my two half kilogram masses, put them both on the balance, they balance two. So I know that I have two half kilogram masses, so I've subdivided the kilogram by one half. So, We've become very good at this process over the years. So we can do this uh, with five masses at a time. And we go by decades. One kilogram to uh, 100 grams. 100 grams down to 10 grams, and so on and so on. But what happens is each time you do that, the uncertainty in the measurement increases. The balance is not perfect. The masses themselves can change slightly. You could have strange effects, like the phase of the moon can be important, if you have that gravitational field, the water table, the density of the air, if the humidity changes. All of these things contribute to uncertainty in the measurement. <coughs> At the kilogram level, our uncertainty is 10 parts per billion, one part in 10 to the 8. Right? Each time you subdivide the kilogram, the uncertainty increases. By the time we get to a milligram, we've gone from parts in 10 to the 8. And I'm showing the mass here on this axis and the uncertainty in mass here. We've gone from parts in 10 to the 8, parts in 10 to the 4. If you extrapolate this linearly, which is a charitable assumption, you can see by the time we get down to nanograms, our measurement uncertainty is as large as the mass itself. So, this is not really a sustainable measurement past a certain point, and we wanted to see what we could do to change that. Um, concurrently, as this idea was developing, uh, something very big happened in the world of measurement. So, we replaced the kilogram. In 2018, the International System of Units, SI, was redefined. Prior to this, there is an instrument called the Watt balance, which is shown here, or the Kibble balance. And it used to be that they would take the kilogram, put it on the Watt balance, and use this to determine flux constant. The Kibble balance uses the current, electrical current, in an electromagnet. 
to balance the full gravitational force of the kilogram. And by measuring the electrical properties, which I'll describe shortly, you're able to determine a value for Planck's constant. The SI redefinition flips the situation around. All the theoretical physicists here will be glad to know that the fundamental constants are no longer changing. We fix them permanently. Now, we use this, Planck's constant, to determine what the kilogram is instead of the other way around. So you don't have to go every six years and update your calculations with the new Planck's constant of electron charge and velocity of light. They are now fixed. Okay. So, um, for my purposes, I'm not going to use a watt balance. I'm going to use a different balance. Let's call the electrostatic force balance. And the electrostatic force here comes from a capacitor. If you've seen maybe in uh, your physics class, if you have two plates of a capacitor, and you apply a voltage, there's a force between the, the, the plates of the capacitor. This is similar here, except instead of a parallel plate, we have a concentric cylinder capacitor. So we have an inner cylinder and an outer cylinder. And the force is between these two cylinders. And we measure the displacement of the two cylinders with the laser interferometer. And so this is the heart of the system here. We have this capacitor attached to what's called a four bar linkage here. This is, there are four pivot points and four, and, uh, four bars here. And this is designed to move this free end vertically. Here. You give us a balance mechanism. So what we can do is we can balance the electrostatic force from the capacitor against the gravitational force from a mass, for example. And this, and with their balance, we will be able to say that they're equal. And this will give us a measurement of our mass. So, um, this mass, uh, here I've written the measurement equation. I should, uh, I'll explain these in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But we need to measure uh, four different quantities here to get to mass using an electrostatic balance. <coughs> we have the radian have capacitance with position, C and C. Voltage we apply to the capacitor here, V. And gravitational acceleration, G. So how do we how do we measure capacitance? What does it mean to measure capacitance? So um, what we do in the International System Units, of the SI, we use uh, what's called a quantum Hall resistor device. And we do an impedance measurement, an electrical impedance measurement. And what this does is it gives us a capacitance or the storage of electrical energy in terms of uh, fundamental constants here. You know, these are outlined in orange here. The electron charge. And the frequency here, this is the basis of the second. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the hyperspine splitting frequency of cesium-133. So this is an atomic property. So this, this uh, cesium atom has, has, a quantum, has two quantum energy levels that are very close together. And the energy level difference can be measured spectroscopically. And this will give you frequency. Right? And so we can measure capacitance using a calibration, chain of calibrations. That's that K here. This is, this is John Escobar here, who works at INM here in Columbia. And they take these fundamental standards, and through their calibration processes, they take these fundamental standards and put them in a, multi, in a box that you can use in your laboratory. Right? And that is this KC here. So if you're wondering what that means, it's an institute. Right? Displacement. Here, similarly, from a laser interferometer. Uh, the definition of length has, for a long time, been fixed by the speed of light and the distance that light travels in a certain amount of time. So, what we have again here is the speed of light and a time that to give us a distance. And this time, once again, is this hyperfine splitting frequency. C is the speed of light. For voltage, what we use is a device called a Josephson junction array. Um, and I'm not going to get into too much detail on the Josephson junction array. Uh, but it basically, uh, you can get a voltage from this based on Planck's constant and the electron charge. So these are more fundamental constants we're using with the ESI. The local gravitational acceleration is pure Newtonian. You take a, a mirror, put it in vacuum, and 
drop it, and you watch the mirror move with the laser in the rock, using an instrument called an absolute preventive. You measure the acceleration directly. And this relies on the speed of light and, uh, and also this frequency of time here for a fundamental constant. Okay. Now, if you take each of these expressions here and put them in this equation, what you get eventually after some math is something that looks like this. Okay? You solve for mass, and this is equal to Planck's constant times this hyperfine splitting frequency divided by the speed of light squared times all of these calibration factors that we use to get from the fundamental standards to our laboratory. So, <coughs> now we, we see how here mass can be linked directly to Planck's constant using electrostatic force within the SI. Now, something interesting about this, you might recognize this, H, H uh, Planck's constant times the frequency from the de Broglie equation. This is an energy, right? So if you rewrite this, bring this speed of light up here, you know, you have Einstein's familiar equation, right? This is mass energy equivalence, that's all this is. Right? That's the basis for this new kind of mass measurement. When we redefine the SI, what this means is that we're going to move away from using a milligram mass, which is a very small object as our standard, to using these, these sort of fundamental processes that are defined by the universe as our standard. So I've spent a lot of time on this slide, so I should move on. Um, so just to give you some metrology, I'm, I am, when it comes down to it, I'm a laboratory person. I like to work doing precision measurement. So, so what does it mean to do a precision measurement with the balance? Okay, so first thing we have to recognize in this equation here, we, these quantities, some of them are not scalar, they are vector quantities. Force, gravitational acceleration, position. These are all vector quantities, and we have to establish a direction. Moreover, we have to establish that our force, that we're, our electrostatic force that we're measuring, is in the same direction as our gravitational force. So, um, so we use an instrument called an autocollimator um, to align uh, the, the tilt of this balance mechanism uh, to within, uh, within 100 nano radius. So that's, that. I, I don't know what that is in degrees, I'd have to look that up, but it's, it's a very, very small tilt. Um, and then we adjust this z-axis to align with gravity to within 0.6 million degrees. And that gives us an error from the cross product of these two uh, within, that is less than one part per million. We specify that in our measurement. So by doing measurements of the balance motion, we can say, okay, we're measuring our electrostatic force that is parallel to gravity. Okay. Then we have a problem of quarter loading years. Remember when, when I was talking about the kilogram subdivision and I talked about a balance here? This would be something like an equal arm balance, right? And what, you're not actually balancing mass here, you're balancing torque, right? So the length of the different arms makes a difference, right? And so you have to not only specify that you have the same force on both sides, but you have the same length for both your measurement arms if you're doing it this way. Uh, part of the reason we have oh, part of the reason we use this four bar language is so that is that so that this free end moves linear up and down. But there's still a small amount of tilt as it moves up and down, and we can measure that. And so what we do is we measure that. And we establish essentially what the distance is to our virtual pivot point. So by measuring the small changes in angle as we go up and down, we still get a moment here, right? But our pivot point is about 20 kilometers away when we adjust this for our corner loading errors. So that means we can put our mass anywhere within a couple of centimeters on this balance pin, and we'll get a, 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 a measurement error of less than a part. And so these are just the things that if you're doing a precision measurement, you need to do these kinds of, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of, uh, take care of these kinds of details. Okay, next, we want to measure our capacitance rate. We do that by moving our cylinder up and down, so we have a fixed cylinder and a moving cylinder. As the cylinder moves down, the overlap between the two cylinders increases, and we can see that here. So our capacitance increases, and as we move down, our capacitance decreases. 
And fitting a line to this is going to give us our capacitance gradient. Uh, it's not actually a line because we have some arcuate motion here. We wrote a paper about it in Measurement Science and Technology. If you're really interested, you can go read the paper. It's a long story. It's, it's entertaining, though. And if you're interested in electric, uh, electrical engineering or something like that, this will give you some interesting insight into the measurement of capacitance. So uh, next, we apply a voltage to the balance to hold it in a constant position. Right. This is what's called a null balance. So we maintain a zero position always. Right. And what we do to do that is we change our voltage. Right. So if we put a mass on the balance, here, our voltage will decrease to, to hold that zero position. And then if we take the mass off, it'll go back up. And if we do this 50 times, we'll get something that looks like this. And we're measuring the middle gram. And so you can see we're, are we have about a little less than about 0.3 nanonewtons of uh, standard deviation here in this measurement. And so uh, and we can do, and we can do this as many times as we want. So we can build up statistics because it's automated. We have a little robot here that will place the mass on the balance again. And we're doing this all in vacuum, also I should mention, just as an experimental uh, balance. So one thing we wanted to make sure that we're doing is we want to make sure if we're developing a new system for measurement, we want to make sure that it agrees reasonably well with the old system so that we don't cause problems for people when we make the switch. So we do, what we do is we compare our, elect, our balance measurements from our electrostatic force balance to measurements that have been done by subdividing the kilogram. So we have mass here measured through the electrostatic force balance. And then some time passes, about a year. And then we did the experiment in red using subdivision. And we said, uh-oh, they're different. You know, and, and you know, so, so well, what do we do with this? You know, well, let's say, okay, there's been a year that passed between these two measurements. <coughs> let's try it again and do them close together. So when we do them close together, you can see here, they agree very well, the two different methods here. Uh, the, the, blue, the blue data is the representative force balance, the red data is subdivision. Um, you can see here what we think is happening, actually, is that things are falling off the mass. So if we have a little small mass, we can actually, that can change over time. If you get a piece of dust on it, the mass will change. If you have a small piece of oxide fall off the metal on the mass, that will change the mass as well. We can see here, but this actually probably changed during one of the measurements, right? So our measurement is now more stable than the masses themselves, right? So it's time to say, okay, I think this is good enough, right? Um, so, you can see also what we get here is in the electrostatic force balance measurement, the other thing is we get a much lower uncertainty in the measurement. So, we've gone a long way towards solving some of the problems that are associated with the subdivision method. Um, I will skip this. This is another story about mass and mass measurement. Um, maybe one thing that is interesting to note about this is that maybe it's not a good idea to use masses that are made out of gold for your weights. The reason for that is that gold is hydrophilic. You can, water will absorb on the surface of, of the mass. And depending on the humidity, the amount of water that absorbs on the mass will change. Our measurements are in vacuum. The measurements of, from the subdivision method are in air. And at first, we, we thought, oh boy, we have another problem. But then we realized, well, probably what's happened is the water is absorbing in vacuum. So we should hopefully expect to see something like that. So this is, you know, nobody uses mass, gold masses. But what's much more common is a stainless steel mass. And you see the effect here too. So this is our electrostatic force balance. This is our subdivision method. And we're just a little bit lower here. And looking at the literature in terms of what you expect to see from water and desorption, we're at about the right range. Uh, so we think we have a good uh, handle on what we need in order to do uh, mass measurements out in the world, use to use the electrostatic force balance as our primary standard for mass. And uh, let's get this. Um, I want to move on now to, uh, to another, um, how we're going to think about doing uh, the smallest force measurements we can with this. So this 
So if we want to if we want to push this balance to its limit, get the best possible force resolution, um, <coughs> we have a trick up our sleeve that we can use. Um, so in, in this balance mechanism, we have a spring here that is that we can pull on. And it, this is actually this is to buckle the balance mechanism. It, it's think of an inverted pendulum if you if you've used anything like that in your physics classes. What happens is this reduces the stiffness of this forearm mechanism. But it does, it does another thing too. It allows us to tune the bias force on this. So we can operate with a very, very low bias force here. So what we can do by adjusting this spring, uh, if, we, if we start down here, if we start up here, we have a very high bias force. Um, we have to apply a high voltage against that to bring the balance into position, right? And up here, because force is proportional to voltage squared, we have we're looking at force here and voltage. We have it's it's proportional to voltage squared, so we have this parabolic relation here. And up at this high bias force, our large change in force only gives us a very small change in voltage, right? If we lower our bias force here to this range. Our change in force gives us a much larger change in voltage. Now we have about we, our, our our voltage amplifier has Johnson noise, right? just from the from the from the amplifier, and this is the same no matter what voltage we work at. So we get a big increase in signal to noise here, and so and so this is uh, and this is the change in voltage we get. We operate at different voltages here, a thousand volts. For a uh, 100 microgram mass, we only get a change of a couple of volts if we operate at that voltage range. If we operate down here at, say, 200 volts, you multiply that by a factor of 10. So, we, so it's much easier to measure. So that's what we do. And so this is an example of a 50 microgram uh, aluminum wire mass that we measure here. This is not your mass. This is a different one. So I'm not, 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 not uh, we're doing an inner comparison right now, so I'm not spoiling the results of the inner comparison. This is a different one. Okay? Uh, this is the uncertainty that's currently available from the commercial products. This is, this is what we measure on the EFB. So we can get orders of magnitude improvement in this uncertainty by using our bag tricks. Okay? I'm going to, I think, skip buoyancy for how much time do I have? Maybe, um, now I'm going to skip the buoyancy connection that I talked about. Okay, here's an example uh, of an uncertainty budget. This is something that, that people who are metrologists think a lot about. We, we, when we're giving a value for a mass that we deliver to you, we don't just give you, okay, this is one milligram, or, or, uh, or 0.99873 milligrams. We say this is 0.99873 milligrams plus, uh, plus or minus one microgram, or plus or minus 0.7 microgram. Right? We have to assign an uncertainty to the measure. And so the way that we do that is we take all of these uncertainties and we sum them up uh, by the root sum of squares method. In this case, uh, I didn't put the, uh, the equation we used to do this on here. Maybe I should have. But you, you maybe get the idea there's a lot of uncertainties that can contribute to this measurement. Um, these here, these three here, are all from our distance, our interferometer, voltage, and capacitance standards, right? We have the, these alignment errors that I talked about here that contribute here. One part to the 10 to the 7 for our measurement, something like that. You can see here that, that this length uncertainty, one part in 10 to the 7, quite good. Voltage, four parts in 10 to the 6. Capacitance, one part in 10 to the 7. These electrical standards are really, really good, have very low uncertainty. This is one of the reasons why this works so well. Um, Straight capacitance, hysteresis, this balance alignment, a few parts in 10 to the 7. And I've highlighted here our limiting uncertainties in all of these cases. And it's our temperature dependence of our capacitance radio. The te temperature changes a little bit. There's thermal expansion, the cylinders move, and it changes our capacitance. So that, that limits our measurement state. Except for this 50 microgram. This is actually the major source of uncertainty here, is our statistical uncertainty. So if we just repeat the weighing many times, 
Here, our standard deviation of all of those measurements is less than the systematic error here from our temperature change. At these small masses, our statistical uncertainty is actually larger. So we make a transition at some point between being dominated by systematic uncertainty to our statistical uncertainty, so just probably thermal noise or Johnson noise in our measurement. Okay? And these are the values we came out with. If you ever see this notation here, what this means, this parentheses, indicates the uncertainty of the measurement. Okay? So here's where we were in subdivision of a kilogram. And once again, this is the mass level, and this is the uncertainty of the mass. And you can see, here's where we, the EFB is active, and we're reducing uncertainty by two orders of magnitude in certain points. And, and remember that transition I mentioned, where we go from systematic to statistical uncertainty? That's where it is. This is my balance resolution. Right? This is where you can see that my balance has limitations too. There's only so far I can go with this balance. But it's certainly an improvement over the subdivision method, at least for now. Okay? If you're really interested in this, I have a paper out that's a low drug, that goes through much more detail than I have here. So if you are really interested in being a measurement geek, you can go look this up. Okay. And so uh, right now, I'm in the process of doing a, uh, a Comparison of masses that are less than one milligram <coughs> with with other international metrology institutes in, uh, in within South America um, within the within the the same international metrologia and uh, and I just brought these masses to, to INM which is uh, which is uh, here here in uh, the top and. Um, and so uh, we're in the process right now of starting to do these measurements with our international colleagues here in, in South America. And so this is what it looks like. These are groups from all over the world who are measuring these small forces and small masses. This is a review article that I did. If you want to learn about, if you want to learn about what the current research is in this area, this is a good place to start. This has all different kinds of people measuring all different kinds of forces. Um, pretty soon, we're going to add to this group all of these Latin American uh, uh, countries and international measurement institutes because we're going to start to do these measurements uh, uh, with them as well. So stay tuned. Okay. Um, the next part of the talk I wanted to give was to talk a little bit about how we can do force metrology with light. Um, and uh, so photons are unusual in that they have no mass, but they have momentum, right, defined by their quantum mechanical properties. Um, if you reflect a mirror, uh, a photon from the surface of a mirror, um, you get a change in momentum. And that change in momentum is a force. And so reflection of light from a surface gives you a force. So, for example, it's a very small force, so, uh, so if you have the force, it's defined uh, in a simplified fashion uh, as two times the power of the, of, the, of the light divided by the speed of light. So, if you're dividing by the speed of anything by the speed of light, it's a good way to get a smaller number, right? Then this is 300 million meters per second, right? So, it's going to take a large laser power and make it a very small force. So for example, this laser pointer here, about one milliwatt, this will, if you reflect it off a, a perfect mirror, at normal incidence will give you about 6.6 .6 piconewtons of force. That's about enough to stretch a DNA molecule, a single DNA molecule out of this brain. So it's not very much force. So for a small force measurement person, this is perfect. We can have this convenient, easy reference that you can point at things and have it go any direction you want, you can have your vector aligned very precisely, and you can measure the power and get to force. And we are hoping it's just that easy. But of course, it's not quite. But um, when we started this project, this is what the world of laser power and small force metrology looked like. Here on the top, the axis here, I have laser power. And on the bottom here, I have force. 
and I'm just moving between these two using this equation here. Right? So you can see here, you know, at, uh, you know, I was talking about before one milliwatt of laser power gives you about six picoliters of force. Okay? And this is the uncertainty that we have. We've talked about over here, right? We started the kilogram right down here. And then the, the microstatic force balance gets us here. In this, end, in this area, laser power morphology comes from an instrument called the cryogenic radiometer. It's a big calorimeter, it measures heat. When you shine the laser in, it absorbs the laser and measures the heat from the absorption. And that tells you the power. This is not too bad, actually, but only over a very small range of power. At about one milliwatt, the uncertainty in this measurement is parts and tens of four. Everywhere else, it's about a percent of uncertainty, right? So over here, our mass standards can be used to improve the calibration of uncertainty in terms of power. So that would be at sort of uh, a watt and above. At a watt and below, our uncertainty in force is larger than our uncertainty in laser power. And so we can use laser power to improve our force calibration uncertainty. So we got together with the sources and detectors group at NIST to measure laser power to try and see if we could figure out a mutually uh, beneficial way to do this. And you know, uh, you know, we started looking into this, and we, and we just took examples from history uh, of photon momentum force. It turns out people have been interested in this for a long time. In the 17th century, Kepler theorized that if you had a comet, it has two tails. Right? <laughs> These are one of them is from the charged ionized gas coming off the surface of the comet. The other one is uncharged particles. And this is actually being driven by the, uh, by, by the, the photon momentum force from the light from the sun is pushing these particles around in space. Um, this wasn't measured accurately until the 18th century uh, by Nichols and Hull, who figured out how to pull a good enough vacuum in their system to use a torsion pendulum to actually measure this for the first time. Um, in the 20th century, we start doing other Interesting things with proton momentum, uh, the Abraham Minkowski debate, I won't get into that, uh, atom trapping, things like that, 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 that some, of you, some of the people here actually uh, are experts in. That and uh, in the 21st century, we're looking at quantum optical mechanics, quantum information, quantum simulation. All of these things are uh, part of the story. Um, what we're going to do, first off, we're going to use our electrostatic force balance to do a measurement of this photon pressure. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our balance, we're going to put a big heat shield here because we're going to put a watt of laser power into this. And as you remember, my balance mechanism is constrained by the temperature dependence of my capacitance gradient. Right? So we want to make sure that our temperature isn't too much of a problem. So we put a big thermal map of a barrier here and put the extension through the end of this barrier. Here's a picture of it. And then on the other end, we put some very high reflectivity mirrors. These are uh, actually grown at NIST. They're semiconductor mirrors, so uh, they're what's called distributed Bragg reflector mirrors. So these are layers of um, semiconductors grown uh, to produce a very, very high reflectivity, uh, sort of a five nines reflectivity. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to we're going to direct light to our to our the mirrors attached to our balance, and we're going to alternate between projecting from the top and the bottom. So what this does is if we have a heat load, at least it's constant. So we always have the same amount of light going into our system. And it also doubles the force we measure, because we're measuring uh, a force from the bottom, a force from the top. So the change in force is actually two times the photon momentum force. And so one side of this, we have a calibrated detector, so we can measure the laser power in situ. One of the nice things about this technique, with the other techniques, you absorb the laser power, so it's gone. You can't use it for anything else. When you use the mirrors, you can still use the laser power further down to do a different measurement or to do laser welding or something like that. Right? Okay, so basically what we're doing here, balancing our electrostatic force against our photonic force. And so, <laughs> Here's an example of some of the results. This is about a 2.8 watt laser beam. 
And, uh, and so here's some data that we have. Here's our force, our force noise, and our laser power detector here. So we measure them at the same time. Okay, that's raw data. Um, I better uh, skip some of this stuff here. Um, a couple of things that we learned along the way, these are lessons about, uh, about um, using optics, using laser power measurements. Um, this is the equation we started with here. It's just 2p over c, right? Well, we also need to know the angle of incidence, right? Of the, of the, of the light. So we, we, but we can measure that, that's okay. And then we have this term here. We have reflectivity, and we have absorption. Reflectivity uh, is counted as twice as large here than as absorption because reflectivity, you have the photon momentum coming in and the photon momentum from coming out. The quantum electrodynamics, right? Reflection process is actually an absorption and a re emission of a photon, right? So that's why reflection is twice as large as absorption. But we have something else here. We have, uh, we have, uh, we have um, diffuse reflection or scattering what I call it. And when we first did this measurement, what we didn't know, and I'll just go back here, is that our laser spectrum here, and this is the power as a function of wavelength, we were expecting just this one line here for our laser, but what we looked at, we saw, oh boy, we have all these other lines. And we'd already taken the data, you know, so, so what are we going to do about this? Um, so what we did is we tried to come up with a correction. We can measure how much light comes from these straight beams. We can figure out how much light that is. So we can make a correction to the measurement. The scattering term, there are two limits we can put on this. Because we don't know the diffuse reflection, it could scatter in any direction. We know the incoming angle, but we don't know the outgoing angle. Right? So there are two limiting cases. One, we have all light is scattered perpendicular to the EFP force measurement, and we have no absorption. So this is just, it, the set scattered light goes in and then it dies. You don't get, it all comes out uh, perpendicular to the force measurement axis of the EMP and the OC. All right? And under those conditions, we get, we get an expression like this. So in our, <coughs> our other limiting case is that all light is absorbed and scattering is zero. So we just get light coming in. And in that case, we just have this term here looks like this. So what do we do? We take the mean of the two. We just say it's somewhere in between there. We're just going to say it's in the middle. And then our uncertainty is these two limits here in the measurement from, from this scattering process. So that's how, that's how we dealt with that. Um, so when we do this, we, uh, we do our measurements. And we measure the uh, force from the electrostatic force balance. And then we use this, as I just described, to measure the photonic force. And we figure, and we figure out, okay, from our laser power measurements here, we get this. And there's 5% difference. Huh. Did we forget something? Well, let, let's, uh, uh, let's go and um, oops, okay. let's go and do another experiment. Right? If we're right at the bottom of our ability to measure forces, we're, we're, uh, we're we have about a uh, a little bit less than a nanonewton of force noise. We're measuring 16 nanonewtons of force. Well, what, what can we do to make the force a little larger? So what we did was we created a parallel plate at a lot here. So we can reflect the beam multiple times. We can get four reflections, so we can multiply our force by a factor of four. Right? This time, we're going to get rid of this stray light with a long pass load. So we don't have the scattering term at all. We don't have to worry about it. Okay? And so we just have two mirror, a two mirror cavity here to reflect the light back and forth the time to increase our force. And once again, we see a four, and this is four point six percent, so five percent difference. So we see a consistent difference between these two. Um, now, what we see, uh, another thing that we see, we we may have made a mistake doing these measurements. We put our detector in our vacuum chamber. The detector was calibrated in air. And it's a thermal detector. Right? It is actually a thermoelectric detector. And so um, we can't necessarily assume that the calibration factor in air and vacuum is the same. 
because the heat transfer from this detector is going to be different in air when you can cool it with convection. In vacuum, you don't have convection cooling because you have no air. So um, when, we when we checked this, we did find a difference in the um, um, we did find a difference in the detector calibration factor, and uh, and we think that that actually is what can explain this discrepancy. Uh, but what it does show is that we do get very good precision from our from our force measurement here. Right, we get a less than a 0.1 percent uh, uncertainty in our measurement, and so this is potentially good enough to improve the uh, laser power power calibration in a watt by two orders of magnitude in terms of the uncertainty. So, so that, that is actually potentially a large improvement for the state of the art. We have a paper on this also, in case you're interested. I will keep going. Okay, so I have, I have a video here uh, just to show you sort of maybe something, one of the reasons, one of the things that we can do with this. Um, this is a laser welding machine. And we're going to measure the photon momentum force in time as we do a laser weld. So we put this instrument in a laser weld head here. And you can see a force, that we, uh, the power we measure with the force balance here in time. Right? And you can see, you know, when we turn off the laser, the force drops. Okay. So this is something that we can directly use in, in a manufacturing process. This is something that we can use today. Okay. Um, <laughs> if we want to get to even smaller uh, forces than this, we want to start thinking about using something besides the electrostatic force balance. Because at a certain point, we're going to run out of room uh, in terms of our resolution. So we want to go to an optomechanical system of some kind. Um, so the, what I'm showing here is sort of a simplified optomechanical system here. We have some mass sitting on a spring that has some damping or dissipation. And what we're going to do is we're going to send light into a meter here to apply the photon force. And we're going to measure the displacement of this mass. So this is just going to be a harmonic oscillator here, right? And we're going to, do, we're going to put a little uh, laser interferometer on there to measure the change in position as we apply the force. Okay? And so here, this is the device we're going to use over here. This is about two millimeters long. It's made out of about two silica. It's a flexure. These two thin arms here bend. So this gives us our spring, essentially. It's like a cantilever spring. But since there are two of them that are connected by this end, what you can see here is that the end of this essentially moves linearly rather than bending at an angle. You get the end moving straight up and down. Uh, and that's helpful because that allows us to say, OK, if we apply a force here, we can measure displacement here. All right? And so we put two cavities up here with fiber optic cables. So these are uh, maybe 100 micrometer diameter fiber optic that we, that we, uh, that we, uh, that we just use a, a, a fiber cleaver that you get off the shelf to make these little tiny pieces of fiber that glue to our sensor, just by hand, under a microscope. Uh, we, we coat one of these with gold to act as a mirror, and we send in our laser here to drive Oscillator and measure displacement here. Okay, and this is supposed to be how it works, a little illustration of what it's supposed to do. So, here we're measuring, sending in our light to generate a force. It's going to move this spring, and then we'll measure displacement here with this. And if it's a harmonic oscillator, we can drive this at its resonance and get an enhancement in the motion. By the, uh, by the quality map of the resonator. Um, I will skip this for right now. This is the area function and uh, some interesting um, characteristics of our laser interferometer. What you'll notice here is that, is that uh, where we're operating here at about one kilohertz in frequency, uh, we're approximately at the shot noise limit of our detector, um, and we are at about, our noise is about 20 femtometers per root hertz. Uh, so, just to give you an idea, the, the distance between a hydrogen and an oxygen in the water molecule is about 50 picometers. So, we can potentially measure 
displacements with this that are really, really, really small if we're careful about it. So we can, the fact that we can measure these small displacements means we can measure very, very small forces. Because this is just basically a Hooke's law spring. Force equals the spring constant times the displacement. That's what we're doing. We might use it as a resonator, so that'll be against the motion by a factor of the quantity factor here. Um, here are some of our results. Um, so I'll just come down here and show you this first. Uh, this is uh, some force measurements that we did. And this is scales and femto newtons here. So you can see here we apply a force of 600 femto newtons. And here we apply a force of 780 femto newtons. And these are pretty well separated. We decided to be conservative with this because we're missed. We don't want to claim uncertainties that are unwarranted. So we say, okay, our, our uncertainty in our force is twice our standard deviation. So that's about 14 femtonewtons in our pastoral precision. So, so we can get uh, femtonewton force measurements from these sensors. Um, one of the questions that comes up is how do you calibrate this force? So we know the laser power that comes in, and we'd like to say, okay, it's just the laser power, but we have to check. We have to make sure that this isn't just, uh, this isn't just, we're not just saying it's going to be a full time of energy, we want to be sure. So we use another method to do this. Um, so let's see here. Uh, uh, I don't have a. Um, oh, there we go. Just real quick, I should have put this on my slide, maybe. But, um, uh, for a harmonic oscillator, uh, the frequency uh, is equal to the spring constant over the mass square root to the one half power. Right? So if we change the mass, the frequency, uh, if we increase the mass, the frequency is going to go down. Right? Now, if you guys remember, I, I, I just figured out a way to calibrate very small masses. Right? We can take these little tiny masses and put them on our sensor. Right? And so and this will actually change the mass and give us a measure of this spring stiffness. Okay. Right? So we do that, and we look at the change in resonant frequency here. The mass off and the root of the mass on it increases here. That gives us a value for our spring stiffness here. From the photon momentum method, we also get a spring stiffness here. And they agree to about a half percent. So we have two different methods that, that agree to a half percent. We're happy to start. This will, this will work well for people doing things like a common force microscopy or instrument implementation. It means that the level basically a percent of the level of uncertainty. Okay. Um, the next step in this process is we want to see if we can use, uh, if we're not happy with these really small forces, we need the femto newtons to pico newtons, we want to get it a little bit higher. We can use um, with, uh, high finesse optical cavity. So, <coughs> in the previous device, we had one of these optical fibers here. It's set in light, reflected once from, from this mirror that's not in our reflection here, and it goes back out. Right? If we, if we create a high reflective decoding on both the ends of these, both of these fibers and make a little tiny fiber lens here with Matthias Keller from Strathclyde University in the UK. We can get, the, we can get what's called a, uh, a high finesse optical cap. So this, in this case, light reflects many, many times between these two mirrors. So we can send in, you know, a milliwatt of laser power and actually get a watt of circulating optical power inside here because it reflects a thousand times before it exits on average, right? And so here, here's, uh, here is our, um, here is what happens when we get to one of these points where we have essentially a constructive interference of the light coming in. We get, all of our power gets dumped into this cavity, right? So our, the reflected power coming back goes to very close. Right? And so what that allows us to do, allows us to go from uh, uh, pico newton forces up here to nano newton forces. So we get an enhancement of this magnitude of this force of about a thousand. So we can use this to get to, uh, to larger forces. And you can go uh, much higher with this. We have, our cavity has a finesse of a thousand, which means we get you know, about uh, 500 bounces of this light. People make cabin, optical cavities that have a finesse of 100,000. 
you know, and put them in the laboratory. So you can envision going, you know, a factor of, you know, um, a factor of two higher than this to get up to, get up to micrometers of force, and, uh, and you know, or a micrometer of force. And in that regime, we can directly compare to our, to our small masses. Okay, radio frequency power metrology. I'll try to get through this quickly. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip the relevance and go right to what I consider to be the fun stuff. This is the experiment. This is easy. This is a really easy experiment. We took <coughs> commercial ballots that we had um, and put the radio frequency wave back. So this would be like an antenna for, uh, for 30 gigahertz uh, radio frequency uh, power. So this would be like a cell phone, something that would be coming out of a cell phone antenna. Right? And we send all of this power down the waveguide onto our ballots and have it reflect back to uh, a detector. And we wanted to see, okay, we could use this for laser power, but can we also use the use this for RF power? Because these radio frequency, uh, this radio frequency energy is photons as well. So it's still a photon momentum experiment. Okay? We published the results of this recently. Um, you can see here, here's where we turn on the RF power, we turn it off, and we turn it on repeatedly. And we do this a bunch of times. And here is what we get in terms for our comparison. The straight line is from a uh, is from a calibrated detector that is typically used for these RF power measurements. Here is our little balance, and you can see there is about a half uh, dB of uncertainty, which is about uh, rather a discrepancy of about half dB. Our force measurement is a little bit higher. You think what's happening is that remember how I was talking about you can get multiple reflections of the photons in a cavity. Well, if we get a little bit of this light coming out from the end of this waveguide, it reflects back off the edges. We'll get that, oh, effectively a larger power in that cavity than we measure. And so we think that's what's happening here. But it's an important first step, because we can do this now at any frequency we want. In fact, the higher the frequency, the better. And so, uh, and so we can go up to things uh, like 100 gigahertz and millimeter wave, even terahertz, um, metrology potentially. And these are places where no detection method is accurate. There is no standard, there is no metrology. Um, okay, so in conclusion, um, I think I did try to give you an overview of what has been happening in mass metrology, some of the big changes that have been happening, um, and so and why we're, uh, why we're doing this, um, and told you a little bit about the electrostatic force balance, um, and how we can decrease the uncertainty in our measurement, um, and, uh, and maybe some new opportunities in RF and laser power measurements that can be uh, conducted in this space. I want to give my thanks to massive force group members, uh, my postdocs, uh, Julian Sterling, um, Ryan Wagner, uh, and John Welcher, who are in this event on the work. If anybody has any questions or wants to talk, I'd be happy. So the, the the watt balance, um, the watt balance is designed for a kilogram of mass. So it's it's uh, it, it uses an electromagnet. Right? I use a capacitor right, to get the electrostatic force. They use an electromagnet to get a, uh, an electromagnetic force, and it's a really really big magnet. <coughs> they want to get something that is ten newtons of force from it, and they can do that with their balance, uh, with an uncertainty of 20 parts per billion, right? So it's a much lower uncertainty than what I have. But keep in mind, uh, keep in mind that, that that is designed to do one kilogram. If you tried to do uh, 10, 100 micrograms with it, your uncertainty would be much larger because uh, 20 parts per billion on, on a kilogram is about 20 micrograms of uncertainty. So it's really designed for those large masses, large from my perspective, right? 
and uh, it does extremely well there. Uh, the electrostatic force balance um, is really designed to be, it's, it's smaller, smaller instrument, um, and, uh, and it uses the electrostatic actuator, which doesn't generate as much heat. And so both of those things make it a little bit more suitable for doing these small force measurements. Which is the influence of the geometry in the electrostatic balance, because you have a circle. Yeah. 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 If you okay, let's so you have a concentric cylinder, right? One of the reasons we decided to to make a cylinder rather than a parallel plane. Well, the first one was because we thought the cylinder would be linear. If you as you change the overlap between the uh, between the two cylinders here, we have our outer cylinder and our inner cylinder here. If we move this down, the overlap increases, so the capacitance increases. Looking from the top down, it looks like this, right? You're hoping to exploit the radial symmetry of the force. So, to help us direct our force vector, right? So, if we align the field, we have to do two things to do that. One, we have to machine a very good cylinder. Fortunately, there are uh, the lathe is actually a really good technology, and people have developed it for hundreds of years, and have developed very good methods of making very good cylindrical objects from these. That's another reason that we chose to fill up the cylindrical geometry, because it can be made into a very good cylinder, right? The other thing that's important, once we have two very good cylinders here, we have to make sure we're in the middle of this so that our force vectors from the sides cancel, right? So we exploit the radial symmetry. Fortunately, there's a very easy trick for that because <coughs> the capacitance is nonlinear. <coughs> if, if I move the cylinder in this direction, say, this capacitance will increase faster in this direction than this capacitance, right? And so the effect of that is our, capacit our net capacitance net, uh, uh, that capacitance decreases if we move offset. And so if you get, if you perfectly center this, you can translate it in both directions, and progressively maximize our capacitance. And that tells us we're right in the center. And when we do that, under those conditions, uh, under those conditions, the, 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 uh, the force that we get should be right through the central axis of the center. How do you realize what physical phenomena affect the measurement? Uh, for example, how do you realize that transverse, transverse of capacity, capacitance uh, was a source of transfer time? Well, very good question. So, we'll see how, far, how fast I can go back here. Right? Um, So that yeah, close to the good. So we start off in our uncertainty analysis with our measurement equation. That's here. We want mass. We see uh, this is how we measure it. We use the measurement of these quantities here. Okay. We know right away that any uncertainty in any one of these quantities will end up as uncertainty in our final measurement. Right. So we know right away that our capacitance uncertainty. Is going to be important. Our voltage uncertainty, we actually have to multiply it by a factor of two because it's a voltage squared, right? Um, and so the other things are a little bit, uh, you know, uh, more subtle perhaps. Um, so the alignments, we just think about, okay, if we want our force to be parallel to gravity, you know, we have to align it and we measure how closely it's aligned to gravity. So we can say that those things are, uh, we can measure those things and take them into account. We measure temperature of the balance, right? So when, when I say our limiting factor in our measurement is the temperature dependence of our capacitor here, 
It's because we're measuring the temperature while we're doing the measurements. And occasionally what will happen is our air conditioner fails and our temperature goes way, way up. And if we happen to be doing an experiment, we say, okay, we can use this data. And we measure our capacitance gradient as the temperature increases while the temperature goes up. And we see, okay, for this amount of temperature change, we get this amount of change in our capacitance gradient. And for that, and measuring our temperature while we do our mass measurements, we can estimate what it is that our uncertainty is there. Now, I want to be clear about something, though. There may be something I have missed. It's always a possibility. This is our best effort. Here. But what we do in order to make sure that, that we're not completely crazy is we check against other methods, right? Okay. Uh, would you explain uh, the different measure in mass taking into account the air density? Oh, oh, you want the buoyancy correction? Sure, sure. I, I skipped that. Yes. Um, let's see. Where is that? Here we go. I do measurements in vacuum, um, uh, but most people would do measurements in air. Right? And uh, if you're an international metrology institute, you make a mass standard, you report what's called the true mass, which would be essentially equivalent to the mass in vacuum. Right? When you put the mass in air, the mass displaces a small amount of air. And this is just like Archimedes, right? When you displace that, that that volume of gas, the volume that you, of the gas that you displace acts as a buoyant force on the mass. So it decreases the apparent weight. The weight, the mass is sort of floating on the air. Not floating up, you know, but, but, but there is a force from the air it's displaced. You can measure, you can account for that by knowing the density of your mass and the density of the air. So the density of the air requires that you measure humidity, temperature, and pressure, right? When I send out a report for a mass calibration, um, I, uh, I mention this in here, and I say, okay, in the worst case scenario, the, uh, the, the, lowest, uh, the lowest pressure and humidity that's been measured on Earth in the eye of a hurricane is this, and this leads to this density of air, and the highest pressure is this, right? And so that gives you the, somebody who doesn't have anything, any way to measure air density or temperature, pressure, humidity, a way to at least get an idea about what their what this buoyancy correction is. For my masses, um, this is about one part of ten to the five magnitude. So it's ten parts per million correction. I think for ten parts parts of ten to four. I have to check that. Not one of those two. Only in a factor ten. It depends how accurately you need to know gravity. For me, I only need an uncertainty of, of, part, of one part of 10 to the 6. Um, uh, I, I really, it, it, my colleagues who do these measurements uh, tell me that, you know, that it's never going to change effectively at one part of 10 to the 6. If we do one measurement in my lab, that's fine forever, essentially. In the watt balance, where they have to do parts of 10 to the 8. The, the height of the water table, the water underground, is important, right? And they have to characterize their gravity as the water table changes. They have to characterize it as a function of the phase of the moon. They have to measure the tides. At, when you're measuring a kilogram of parts of 10 to the 8, you have to have a very good measurement. Fortunately, I chose the easy measurement, so, so I don't have to worry about all that stuff. But it's a good question to ask because it does matter at the highest levels of precision. You told us that it's not a good advice to have two waves made of gold, 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 so gold. Water absorbs or most surfaces. Yeah. 
or perhaps aluminum is the absorption of water over aluminum is lower than in gold. But, yeah. but uh, however, I think the density of gold be higher. It, it is uh, a better. It is better because it introduces lower uncertainty in buoyancy. It'll help if you can measure. If you can measure the. Um, if you can measure. Well, so first of all, we just you know say that. For, for most purposes, you know, we're looking at a change of um, um, 0.05 micrograms. And so, usually it's not that big a deal, right? You might be able to, um, the, the problem is that you don't exactly know what it is because it changes, if that makes any sense. Because, because the absorption of water changes with humidity, for example, right? That could be, you don't know what the effect is. And it could be, it, it can be very large. You can, you can if you go, um, I saw people doing experiments with AFM where they would go and at 80% humidity, image the surface of gold, they find pulse, essentially, on the surface. And so it's very important how you prepare the surface of the gold. <coughs> Which is, with the buoyancy correction, you can know exactly what that is. You can characterize that very well. And uh, if you measure the temperature, pressure, and humidity, you can at least know what that is predictably. Right? So uh, on the balance, we, we say that, uh, that we would prefer to use other materials than gold be just because we can predict, um, at least we know what our uncertainty is with the buoyancy measure. Right? With the gold, it's hard for us to say. So even if it's higher, we'd prefer to be able to give more accurate value. That's more of a philosophical choice. Another trick could be to reduce the surface, because if you use a sphere, the surface is lower than a wire. Yeah. The spheres of this size are very difficult to handle. That's a practical choice. That's, right. That's a practical choice. We've, I've, I've, tried, I've actually tried very small spheres of uh, a colleague of mine from Australia sent me you know, some very small spheres of gold. And you can't pick them up with tweezers. Well, you have to, you know, I, I took a, a, a pipette that's a drop of water and then dabbed it on there and the, the, the sphere got taken up into the water. Then I put the drop of water on the surface and let the water evaporate. So that's how you can, you know, it, it, it can be done, right? It's not a bad idea. But, uh, but, but it will take somebody a lot of time. So, thank you very much. Thank you.